In this second video in our introduction to airbrushing series, we're going to take a look at the different types of paints we have available to us and how we can mix them up to use them in our airbrush. Lots of different manufacturers make paint for miniatures painting, and although they're designed to be used with a paintbrush, a lot of them work perfectly well through an airbrush with the right kind of thinning. A lot of these brands and others also make paint specifically for airbrushing, and often it's not simply a case of it being thinner paints. There'll be additives put into the paint that will make them behave better. Now there's a few types of paints that can often throw up problems when you airbrush with them. Metallics, such as this lead belcher by Citadel, and also paints with an extreme finish, such as this scale 75 color, Caspian Blue, but a lot of that range have a very, very matte finish. The reason that the metallics can be a bit tricky is due to the size of the flake. It's what makes them glittery or reflective. So when we thin them down, Although we change the medium that the flakes are contained in, the size of the flakes themselves doesn't change. One of the alternatives we can have for the metal paints is to use a dedicated airbrush metal such as Vallejo Metal Color Series. These have a much, much finer flake in them, so you won't tend to get clogs in the airbrush. And if we want to produce a really, really matte flat color, what we could do is take a paint that's the color we want and then simply apply a matte varnish over the top of it. Now let's take a look at the ways we can mix the paint to use it in the airbrush. Firstly, using a separate vessel to pre-mix the paint in. So I've used a little dish here. To be honest, something like a shot glass is gonna be more easy to pour the paint into the cup with afterwards. And then I'm adding some thinner. And with all paints, there's no such thing as this golden ratio. We always start 50-50 paint to thinner, and we see how that then behaves in the brush. We'll talk a bit more about that later. But you can see with this separate pot, we just mix it up, test it on the side to see the consistency, and once it's roughly what you want it to be like, and you will get used to this over time and with experience, you're good to go. take your brush and just pour the paint in. This is definitely the cleanest way of doing things. It does take a while. An alternative is to do the same thing, but directly into the cup of the brush itself. So we put our thinner in first, then we get some of the paint and just mix it in exactly like we did in the dish. A positive to this is it's a little bit quicker because we're not having to use another vessel and then pour it in. But one of the big negatives is that if one of those little bristles off this paintbrush comes off and lodges itself with somewhere within the brush, even a very, very small bristle off a paintbrush can cause a significant blockage when you're only working with fractions of millimeters on your nozzle. And again, you can just test the consistency on the side of the cup. Now the method that I use is I've put the thinner in already and I'm just going to pop the paint in off my brush, but I'm not going to use my brush to mix it around with. And I'm deliberately showing you this with paint where we've had to use a brush to decant it out of the pot. With a dropper bottle, obviously it's even easier and cleaner. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use the airflow of the brush to mix the paint and the thinner together. You can see on the end of my brush, I haven't got a guard over my needle. So as I approach the brush, I need to pinch the end of it to block out any air or paint. I don't want to go perpendicular and risk bending it. So carefully, with a piece of cloth, I'm going to pinch the end of the brush, and I'm going to push down to create some air, and pull back on the trigger ever so slightly to release the paint into the airflow, and it's forced back into the brush and it bubbles up, and this mixes the paint and the thinner together. It's important to be quite gentle with this stage. You don't need to pull all the way back like that. If you do, you're going to end up covering your surface in paint. A nice little bit of kit that comes with our Harder and Steenbeck Cold Paint Infinity and Cold Paint Evo is this little cover that you can put over the end to perform the same function as the piece of cloth. 
when it comes time to spraying the actual paint, you're going to often run into one or two problems. This is the first, spidering. This is caused by the paint being too thin for the pressure it's being sprayed at. Now here in the UK, we teach and we personally paint where we spray at a pressure of 20 PSI. We just use the proprietary thinners, Medea, Life Color, whatever. So to fix this issue of spidering, we've got a few options. We can either make the paint thicker, we can hold our brush further away from the model so it's not hitting it with the same force, or we can lower our PSI or the pressure. If you have a good double action airbrush, you can also change the pressure that you're spraying at by how much you depress the trigger. Depending on what it is you're trying to do with the paint, it's going to determine which one of these options is correct. There is no one size fits all consistency or thinner ratio for paint. It all depends on the job. If I'm base coating my tank, I'm going to want thicker paint than if I'm trying to glaze over a very, very thin filter to alter the colour. And just because a paint says it's for airbrushing, it doesn't necessarily mean it's ready to use straight out of the pot. You need to get used to what the paint is going to behave like at different consistencies, and then you can plan accordingly. The opposite problem to the spidering is when we get this speckling effect. And this is caused when the paint is too thick for the pressure. And 99 times out of 100, the fix for this is just to thin the paint further. There are certain brands of paint that are absolutely fantastic for airbrushing, and Tamiya is one of them. It's slightly different to the usual sorts of paints we use for painting our miniatures with, in that it's a solvent-based acrylic. A few things to be aware of is that it has a fairly limited colour range, and most of them come in either a flat XF or a glossy version, X and then the number. I'd really recommend you at least pick up, say, a black and a white to have a play with. Because they are a solvent-based paint, we need a solvent-based thinner to use with them. In this case, I use Tamiya X20A thinner. You can always mix up your own if you want, distilled water, isopropyl alcohol, etc. There's loads of recipes out there. But a little pot like this is going to last me ages. People will often be put off Tamiya or dismiss it because of the fact it's a solvent base. Oh, it's worse for your health, you don't want to breathe it in. But as we discussed in the previous video, even when we're spraying non-toxic paints, we don't want to be breathing them in. So adequate ventilation and a good respirator, you're going to be just as safe using a Tamiya as you are using a water-based acrylic. And the benefits are absolutely huge. One of the most positive, consistent pieces of feedback we get from our glasses is when people have first been introduced to using Tamiya paints and they suddenly realise just how user-friendly they are. And the reason they are so good is because we're able to thin them down much, much further than our normal water-based acrylics and still maintain a huge degree of control over the paint without it spiderwebbing off in all directions. So I've got some Tamiya in here. I'm spraying at 20 PSI, probably thinned it at least four to one. This is what we're looking for from paint through our airbrush. No spidering, no splattering. I can go close to the model. I can pull further back and cover a larger area. All of the techniques I'm gonna use when I'm painting my various miniatures. We've now looked at our airbrush and all the kit that goes with it and also all the different types of paints we can use in the brush. There are so many different paint brands out there now that you're almost guaranteed to be able to find the colour you want that behaves as you want it in the airbrush. So if you can, get hold of a few brands that maybe you haven't tried before. The final part of the series will cover cleaning and maintenance. I hope you're enjoying it so far and you can see that airbrushing really doesn't need to be intimidating. Please make sure you put any questions you've got in the comments section below and I'll try my best to answer them in future videos. But if you do enjoy airbrushing and you want to get more out of it, it's something we cover quite a lot of in our Patreon. If you've enjoyed the video, hit the like button and if you haven't already, hit subscribe so you don't miss out on any more. And I'll see you in the next one.